From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 83, recorded on October 13th, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on Important Health Topics. I don't know, Paul, when you started this column, did you have any idea that we would end up where we are today? No, I don't think anybody did. It, this is as worse than anybody could would have ever imagined about how we have just shredded our public health infrastructure. Yeah, this every week something new, the destruction of the CDC, the destruction of public health, destruction of NIH and FDA. I never envisioned that any of that would happen. You know, I didn't think it could. Neither did I. You assume that there were checks and bounces that wouldn't allow it to happen, but we were wrong. Well, today we're going to continue with <laughs> the destruction of United States public health. We're going to take a look at Paul's latest column called Vaccines Don't Save Lives. Oh, my gosh. So let's start with a hearing where Senator Maria Cantwell uh, presented some information about uh, vaccines. That was a finance committee hearing. What did she say? So she, she put up a chart that showed how vaccines have saved our lives, millions of lives, allowed us to live decades longer than we did before. And she went through sort of vaccine by vaccine by vaccine to show you how many lives were saved. The history on vaccines is very clear. This is the 20th century. That's how many people had vaccines and had illnesses. This is the 21st century. This is the decrease, 99% down to 100%. This is what was delivered with vaccines. And I presume these charts were based on real data from CDC, right? That's right, when we still had a CDC, yes. Yes. So I assume millions of lives had been saved on those charts, right? That's right. And what was RFK Jr.'s response to this presentation? Well, that presentation was largely for his benefit. Um, because he has consistently expressed anti-vaccine points of view. She wanted to state the obvious, which is that vaccines are important. You wouldn't think you would have to say that to somebody who's now Secretary of Health and Human Services, but she did. His response was to make a seven-minute video on X that basically contradicted what she said. So he showed predominantly two graphs. He showed a graph of measles in, in this country, um, over the past, say, 100 years. And he showed a graph of whooping cough or pertussis over the past 100 years to make the point that the incidence of deaths was declining even before there was a vaccine. Well, you can see from this graph that in 1900, some 13,000 Americans a year were dying of measles. By 1960, however, this number had dropped to a few hundred. But the measles vaccine was not introduced until three years later. Therefore, almost all the measles mortality had disappeared before the vaccine. So the measles vaccine can't really claim the credit for saving all those lives. And that, that decline was related to better sanitation, better nutrition, uh, cleaner water, uh, better hygiene, etc. And to make the point that vaccines really aren't saving our lives, it is amazing to me that he felt compelled to do this when we have outbreaks of measles whooping cough and uh, influenza that is killing children in this country that now he, he wants to put out the notion that, you know, vaccines aren't really saving our lives. So, but th these, these uh, measures, sanitation, for example, probably contributed to reduction of deaths, right? Yes, it did. In the case of measles and, and whooping cough, yes, it contributed to it. But if you look at measles, when the measles vaccine was introduced in 1963, we had 500 mostly children who would die every year from measles. We've reduced that to virtually none. When the whooping cough vaccine was introduced in this country in the late 1940s, we had 9,000 children dying every year from whooping cough. Now we have fewer than 10. So he neglected to mention those two facts when he was showing these charts. So this is another example of him lying to make his point. That's right. He mi misrepresents information so he can consistently try and make the point that vaccines aren't really that important and that what we should really focus in on is better nutrition. So the, um, the introduction of vaccines, he would argue, 
the decline in deaths is just a continuation of improved sanitation. Refrigeration, I think, was one of them. I guess that has to do with preserving food, right? Right. So how, how would you argue that uh, uh, the effect of the vaccine is not just a continuation of those measures? Well, because um, we, we had sort of hit a, a nadir where you would have every year, say for measles, you would have three to four million cases, you'd have 48,000 hospitalizations, you'd have 500 deaths every year. After, after that dramatic improvement occurred, it wasn't until you introduced the measles vaccine that you saw a precipitous decline in, in mm-hmm. hospitalizations. And that's the same thing was true with whooping cough. So he was sort of ignoring that aspect. And also, more importantly, there are a number of infections that have um, been dramatically reduced that had nothing to do with improved sanitation or hygiene. Could also argue that the recent introduction of vaccines for respiratory or syncytial virus has had the same effect, right? That same number of cases every year, and now suddenly they're declining. Exactly right. So once over the past year, now that we have a maternal vaccine uh, against respiratory syncytial virus, and we also have a monoclonal antibody that can be given in the first couple of days of life that decreases the incidence of respiratory syncytial virus. Just over the past year, you've had a more than 50% decrease in children less than two months of age being hospitalized. It, to the extent actually that it actually uh, lowered infant mortality rates, that's only from the vaccine and the monoclonal antibodies, nothing to do with sanitation or hygiene. You also make the point in your column that it's not just about deaths that are prevented by vaccines, but people who survive have other problems, right? Sure. I mean, measles virus can cause blindness and deafness. Mumps virus can cause deafness also. Uh, rubella can, or German measles can cause con- congenital rubella syndrome, which would cause 20,000 cases every year of blindness and deafness and heart defects in children. And also Haemophilus influenza B, which certainly dominated my pediatric residency. I mean, I was a pediatric resident at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh from 1977 to 1980, when I was on call in the emergency department, I would do two to three spinal taps every night to, because most of what we saw was Haemophilus influenza B, which was a bacteria that caused meningitis, sepsis, pneumonia, epiglottitis. Now, most residents at our hospital, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, don't know how to do spinal taps. <laughs> we have a person come in with meningitis. It's often the interventional radiologist that does the spinal tap. Mm-hmm. Because we've gone from twenty to 25,000 cases every year of hemophilus influenza type B to virtually less than 50 every year because of that vaccine. Nothing to do with hygiene, nothing to do with sanitation, nothing to do with refrigeration, nothing to do with, with uh, nutrition, and everything to do with that vaccine. One virus absent from his presentation was poliovirus. Why didn't he mention the effect of sanitation on that infection? Well, see, you know this story much better than I do. Um, Polio was a common disease um, in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s. And then what happened was when a child would be born, invariably the mother had been exposed to polio and only about one in 200 people or so who who were infected with polio would become paralyzed by it. So many people had antibodies to polio, but never had um, paralysis. Mostly they suffered a summer gastroenteritis. So the mother would then transfer those antibodies passively to the baby. Because polio was common, the baby was often exposed to polio early in life. So it was kind of this passive active immunity. You would get exposed to the virus at the same time you were getting antibodies from the mother, which were protective. So the term infantile paralysis was always, I think, an incorrect term. As we got better and better at having better hygiene, better sanitation, now the mother's antibodies would have worn off by the time the child was finally exposed to the virus when he was five years years of age, nine years of age, and then you saw an actually increase in paralysis. So sanitation and hygiene uh, improvements only increase the incidence of polio in this country. And so what stopped polio in this country? A vaccine, a vaccine that was introduced first in 1955 and that basically eliminated polio from this country by 1979. Nothing to do with sanitation or hygiene and everything to do, again, with that vaccine. I wonder if he knows this or, and, and he ignores it because it doesn't fit his narrative or he doesn't actually isn't actually aware of it. Most people are not. You're right. Most people are not. I mean, what's interesting to me is when I published that sub stack about this particular issue, I had a number of infectious disease specialists in our hospital say, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. You would always assume that the impact of sanitation is a, is a positive one. But in the case of polio, it interestingly was a negative one. I mean, all the positive effects outweigh it, but 
still, yeah, that was responsible for the increase uh, post-1900 when we started to see bigger and bigger outbreaks uh, in the U.S. Exactly. So uh, there, there are many things that RFK says that are inconsistent. Surprise, surprise, right? For example, he's allowed the CDC to say you can get a COVID vaccine, you could get a flu vaccine. Why would he do that if he says they don't save lives? I can't imagine to understand how he thinks. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, if you look at, at what he's done just regarding one aspect of the COVID vaccine, um, at the end of May, he stood up and did a one-minute video with Marty McCarry, the commissioner of FDA on his right, and Jay Bhattacharya, the head of NIH on his left. And he said, we, Health and Human Services, are no longer going to recommend this COVID vaccine for healthy children or healthy pregnant women. That's what he said. And then he said, it's just good science and common sense. I couldn't be more pleased to announce that as of today, the COVID vaccine for healthy children and healthy pregnant women has been removed from the CDC recommended immunization schedule. With these two heads of NIH and FDA nodding in agreement. Then what he did was he um, took that off the CDC immunization schedule. So if you looked at COVID and pregnancy, it was a non-recommendation. Now, more recently, the, co the, the COVID vaccine is recommended for pregnant women uh, under, under the sort of guise of uh, individual uh, decision making or shared clinical decision-making. And so he's gone from not recommending it, putting it on the schedule, and now it, apparently it is recommended with shared clinical decision-making. So it's confusing, and I think that's the point. I think the point is to be confusing, because it are, as people are confused, immunization rates will erode, and that is his goal, to make vaccines less available, less affordable, and more feared. He thinks vaccines have simply replaced infectious diseases with chronic diseases. He says that over and over again. He thinks his mission is to eliminate chronic diseases, which in large part means eliminating vaccines. I don't think people realize how serious he is about this. What's unfortunate is that one person's view is controlling the narrative now in the U.S. Um, he has, you know, the anti-vaxxer crowd behind him and a, and a small handful of Americans. But I think most people realize that vaccines are important. Just looking at the comments in this substack, uh, it, one lady said, vaccines are the best things that human ever invented, could be. So how can we let one person dictate this? I just don't understand it. I thought our system was resilient enough that it wouldn't be affected in that way. So did I. I mean, if you look at polls of parents' re uh, attitudes about vaccines, if you sort of set aside the COVID vaccine, most parents, Republican or Democrat, more than 80 percent value vaccines, value school vaccine entry requirements. So he doesn't represent most parents, not at all. He represents a small part of very loud vocal parents that have at some level kind of infiltrated this whole Make America Healthy Again movement. Uh, but he doesn't represent most parents. And you would think since he doesn't represent most parents and we have pe people uh, who are in the House and people who are in the Senate who represent those parents, that they would stand up. Because I know that they're getting letters. They are getting letters from parents. I've had uh, congressmen mm. tell me that. Yet still, they just refuse to stand up for the health of children in this country because they value their political career apparently more than they value the health of the children in this country. Until that changes, children are going to continue to suffer. Let's do a hypothetical poll. Let's say that at the next uh, elections, the Congress is flipped. Would that have any impact on what RFK Jr. is doing? I think it would. I think if they have a majority in the House, I do think they will be able to force play enough to at least get RFK Jr. to be replaced. And so you can still have your Maha movement about which there are many good things, but not, not have an anti-vaccine activist heading that Maha movement. I do think that's possible. But then again, I'm an optimist because, as you know, I'm a Philadelphia Eagles fan. <laughs> okay. Well, on that note, <laughs> I'll leave a link to this column in the show notes so you can go read it yourself. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.